Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I'm going to talk to you about what I would do if my child had autism. So first of all, I don't have any kids. The reason that I'm making this video is I have several clients with children that do have autism. I've worked with them and I feel like I've developed a very interesting understanding of autism. I do also personally have some autistic traces. I don't have a, an official diagnosis or anything, but I'm sure if I wanted one, I could probably get one. And I know the conversation around autism can be somewhat controversial. So that's why I'm presenting this information in this light. What I would do if my child had autism. So first of all, when we're looking at autism, we have to understand what a sensory processing disorder is because autism is a sensory processing disorder, but there are other sensory processing disorders. And if we can begin to understand what they are and how they work and what causes them, then we're basically halfway to understanding this situation and finding a solution. So in essence, a sensory processing disorder is a situation where the brain is receiving input from the sensory organs. This can be eyes, nose, mouth, ears, skin. This can be things like a balance. This is any kind of sensory input that we are receiving from our environment that then needs to be delivered to the brain and the brain and the brain is then able to take that sensory input and turn it into something meaningful. So a sensory processing disorder is basically where the sensory input is coming in, the sensory organs are working correctly, as in the child can see, it can hear, it has a sense of touch and taste. But when this sensory input is being received by the brain, the brain isn't able to derive meaning. It's not able to form a solid conclusion as to what that input means and it kind of gets jumbled up in the brain and this can cause distress, this can cause overwhelm, confusion and when you're looking specifically at autism not only is some of this sensory input not being processed and understood correctly but we've got this higher level of sensory input being that of social interactions. This is things like tonation of words, facial expressions, emotions and empathy because these are all in a way forms of sensory input but they are very complex. And as you can imagine, the more complex the sensory input is, the more likely the brain is to get confused in its ability to process these things. So long story short, autism is probably the most extreme version of a sensory processing disorder. The brain is receiving accurate sensory information, but it isn't able to process it into something meaningful. This causes a lot of distress, a lot of confusion, and it stops the child's brain from being able to develop correctly. So not only is this input not being received and processed correctly because it isn't especially during this developmental time so in the earlier years of life the brain is still growing it's still forming if this sensory input is coming in and the body isn't able to understand it and make sense of it it actually changes how the brain forms you can look at the brain of a neurotypical versus a neurodiverse person and they literally have different brain structures and this is because the autistic child or the individual with a sensory processing disorder is trying to find the meaning in the sensory input but the brain isn't always able to make a neurotypical connection and therefore it forms in a different way and it creates a different brain. So with that new level of understanding, the next question obviously becomes what is causing the brain to not be able to process this sensory input? What is causing this brain to develop in a neurodivergent way instead of a neurotypical way? And the common denominator here is toxicity. If the brain is being bathed in toxicity, this can come from many different forms. This can be from environmental allergens like molds. This can be from substances that may be contained in certain medical procedures that children are exposed to. This can be from imbalances in the microflora. A very common theme in autistic children are digestive problems. And what's often happened in an, in an autistic child's digestive system is their gut and their gut flora, instead of being a source of nourishment, providing B-complex vitamins and neurotransmitters and other beneficial substances that support the brain's ability to function and to develop, instead becomes their biggest source of toxicity. They're full of parasites and candida and clostridia producing substances like endotoxin and aldehydes and these other compounds that are literally by definition toxic and cause the child's brain to be constantly bathed in this ocean of toxicity. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. Imagine if you're trying to prepare an amazing meal. You're trying to cook something really nice in your kitchen. Imagine if your kitchen is just this disaster zone. It's covered in mess. There's dirt all over the place. There's broken and glass on the floor. There's paint all up the walls. It's just an absolute mess. You're never going to make a good meal. And the brain is trying to take these raw ingredients of sensory input and turn them into this meal of cognitive understanding. And because the kitchen
kitchen, the brain is so messy, it just can't do it. So ultimately the solution is to figure out where this toxicity is coming from and support the body's ability to remove this toxicity. And considering the fact that this toxicity actually causes the brain to develop differently, the earlier we can do this, the more likelihood for higher levels of remission. If a child has an autism diagnosis and they're already over the age of say seven or nine years old, it's very likely that they're gonna have at least mild to moderate traces of autism for the rest of their life. But if you're able to catch autism at the age of two or three, even if it is in a fairly severe presentation, but you're able to provide the body what it needs to function so that the brain can develop correctly, we're able to remove that source of toxicity, you may see the odd trace here or there, but a much normal neurotypical brain will be able to develop. And this is a really good thing because while they is a bright side to autism. There's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of unique and niche specialization in certain subjects. This is normally at a massive cost of social connection, is very emotionally distressing. If you are or you know any parents of autistic children, you know that those children look like they are really struggling. They're struggling to understand what's going on around them. They're trying to make sense. They're trying to understand. They're trying to figure it out and they just can't. And it's so frustrating because it's not that they're doing anything wrong with the behaviors or the understanding that they're trying to develop it's that all of this sensory input is coming in and it just turns into this mess this this big mess in their brain and their brain on a physiological level cannot process that sensory input and it's absolutely devastating it's devastating for the child to experience it it's devastating for parents or loved ones to witness it it's absolutely heartbreaking so let's get solutions orientated and figure out how do we go about tackling this problem so the first step is to identify that initial root cause toxicity and do everything we can to prevent it and remove it from the future. So if this is toxins in the environment, we need to look at changing the environment. I know of a lady that had two children that were that were twins and they were growing in the same room. One was about three and a half meters closer to an air vent where mold toxins were being distributed into the room. The child that was closer to the air vent developed autism and the other child didn't. And when they were able to figure out where that source of toxicity was coming from, they were able to address this underlying root cause, this mold exposure remediate the environment and they saw almost immediate changes in the development of the son that had began to develop autism. So if it's environmental we have to change the environment. If this is due to certain medical procedures then maybe we need to consider alternatives or think about the pacing of the strategy behind these practices. This can frequently happen due to toxicity that is passed to the baby whilst it's still inside the mother. Many of these very harmful toxins are fat soluble. This is the heavy metals like mercury, the mycotoxins, plastics and pesticides. And as the brain is developing in the child, there is a lot of fatty tissue in this area. And these fat soluble toxins have an affinity for this fatty tissue. So it's really important we try to find the source of that toxicity initially and remove it and build a plan around supporting the baby's body to remove as much of this as possible. The next step is to look at the gut flora and try to correct any imbalances that we can see developing in the baby's gut. In the situation where the source of toxicity for the baby is actually the baby's gut flora, let's say the baby is full of parasites or things like clostridia or candida, or even if the root cause was something else and consequentially a microflora imbalance was caused we need to address this. So the first thing we can do is preventative. If we can avoid a C-section, then we should. Babies that are born via C-section have a different microflora. They end up having their guts colonized by more of the skin microbiome from the mother instead of the vaginal microbiome. And nature is intelligent. That vaginal microbiome is determined by the gut flora of the mother. So if the mother has a healthy microbiome and she gives birth vaginally, she'll give that healthy microbiome to the child. And if this wasn't the case, as potentially it was for me, even though I was vaginally birthed, I know my mom had many digestive problems and therefore probably passed much of this gut dysbiosis onto me as well. So first preventative step, avoid C-section births where possible. And if a C-section birth is necessary, make sure that a swab of the vaginal fluids is taken and put in the baby's mouth. This way the baby will be exposed to those microbes that it was supposed to be exposed to if it was delivered the correct way. This is the first and a significant important step. So if you can do this, then do that. If not, then the time's passed there's nothing you can do. But the next step would be to ensure breastfeeding. Breastfeeding will also pass many healthy microbes from the mother to the child. It also provides many immunoglobulins and compounds that modulate not only the gut flora, but also the baby's whole complete immune system. It also contains many types of prebiotic compounds like HMOs, human milk oligosaccharides, 
and other types of prebiotics that help to feed the beneficial organisms so we can establish a healthy microflora in the child. Generally speaking, I would be trying to breastfeed the child absolutely as long as possible. If the child doesn't have any teeth, it shouldn't really be eating any food. And if for some reason the mother's milk isn't acceptable, isn't tolerable to the child, we need to make sure that we're using a really good quality alternative. The powdered milk solutions that are made with soy milk and things like that, these are not good. These are so far from what nature intended a baby to be eating. The very best alternative, if you can get it, would be something like raw goat's milk. Or we could do what we used to do, maybe 100 or 200 years ago, which is wet nursing. This is basically where the mother would have friends that were also pregnant and breastfeeding, or they would go to someone that was literally, this was their job, they were a wet nurse. They would be the nanny of the child, they would take care of the child, and they would also breastfeed it. This way, that other lady that is breastfeeding is providing the prebiotics, the probiotics, these immune stimulating molecules. And I know that culturally, this isn't a very normal thing to do, but this is how we did it. And this is really what works. And if I was in this situation, I know it's not, it's not particularly convenient, but literally the, the child's health is at risk. That is what's at stake here. So if my child was struggling with these problems, I would either be finding a wet nurse or I would be buying a goat and we would be feeding it raw goat's milk. That is what I would be doing. I really don't think the powdered formulas, they're really not that good and not up to scratch. They are not good enough. I'd also be looking at utilizing either probiotic supplementation or potentially using some of this milk if i'm able to get it or if you can't even conventional milk made into fermented foods like kefir could be a really nice place to start now you always have to be careful when you're using any kinds of supplements or medications ever but especially with children and especially especially with younger children the thing is if you're looking at a good probiotic these are the organisms that are supposed to be in their gut already these are the organisms that the mother is supposed to have given to the child that are then being fed and reinforced through the breastfeeding so i would really be looking at using surprise Surprise, surprise, custom probiotics, delactate free formula. I'd probably be looking at a dosage of one baby scoop or less, at least for let's say probably the first three to six months. And as the baby grows, it can tolerate a, a higher dose. The thing is, the thing is, even a baby has trillions of CFUs of thousands of different organisms in the digestive system. And a probiotic at 25 billion CFUs is like a drop in the ocean, even for a baby's gut. And the point I really want to emphasize is these are the organisms that are supposed to be there. The mother's gut flora should have translocated into the child and a good probiotic will mimic these organisms. And you could also look at the fermented foods, especially the fermented dairy, the kefir. That would also be a really nice option. That's definitely something I would be considering. If the child is at the stage where they're beginning to eat, autistic children are notoriously picky eaters and they generally tend towards liking the starchy carbohydrates. These are things like your bread coated, chicken nuggets, fish fingers, crisps, biscuits, cookies, cookies, bread, pasta, and there's nothing wrong with these foods in and of themselves. But when that's all the child is eating, for one, they're not getting enough nutrients. The brain really needs to be nourished so that it can develop correctly. But secondly, these starchy carbohydrates that usually aren't being digested correctly, usually feed and fuel this gut dysbiosis situation. Organisms like the candida and the clostridia, they feast on these substances and produce all of these harmful compounds that bathe the child's brain in toxicity. What's potentially even more sinister is gluten and dairy-based foods, when not digested correctly, can break down into opiate-like substances that literally hijack the child's brain and make them addicted to these gluten and casein-containing foods the same way that a heroin addict is addicted to heroin. And if you have experienced an autistic child not being able to have their gluten and their dairy, it really is like an addict going through withdrawal. And that's literally what is happening in their body. The thing is, this is a vicious loop that we have to break because if all the child is eating is very poor nutrition nutritional food, if all the child is eating are refined carbohydrates that perpetuate this gut dysbiosis situation and don't nourish the child's brain, this is only going to go in one direction and it's not a very good direction. The direction that I would be looking at going would be trying to include as much nutrient density into the child's diet as possible, reduce or remove as many of these low quality nutritionless foods. And I'm not saying they can never have them. I personally really believe in a balanced approach that isn't overly restrictive. However, when you have a complex situation, situation like this on your hands, you do have to take an appropriate level of, of action. I would be personally considering something of a GAPS style autoimmune paleo type of approach. What does this look like practically? This would be consumption of animal products, generally well-cooked animal products. So you're thinking like soups and stews, nose to tail eating. So this includes organ meats and things like meat stock and bone broth. 
and I know what you're saying. You're thinking, I can't get my child to eat anything other than toasted pasta. How am I supposed to get them eating stock and having liver? I get it, but you can figure it out. There are ways to make this happen. There are ways to make these foods more tolerable, more palatable. You can sneak two or three tablespoons of stock into a soup. You can't even notice it's there. You can't even taste it, but the nutrients are there. We can turn things like organ meats, like liver into pate. We can actually make these things taste good. And then even if we're not fully able to remove the toast or the bread at this time, toast with a bit of pate on. Yes, there's still some bad, but we're getting lots of good here too. I know it sounds like a big challenge, but what else are you gonna do? I just know if I was put in that situation, I'd find a way to make it work. I'd find a way to get through. On top of this, I would be thinking about incorporating fermented foods as I'm able. This could be taking a tiny bit of the sauerkraut juice and putting it into a sauce or into a smoothie or into a juice or disguising the taste, at least initially. You have to be kind of sneaky. You have to find a way to make it work. But fermented foods, I'd consider vegetable juicing as well. Generally speaking, carrots seem to be really well tolerated because they're very sweet, but they're also quite antifungal in nature. And you can also add a little bit of fruit in there as well maybe some orange, maybe some pineapple juice. You know, these things still tend to taste quite good, even for an autistic child. So these are easier. But I would really be thinking about a backbone of a diet that is hyper nourishing. Every time the child is putting something in their mouth, you want to be thinking, what nutrients are they getting here? Because if it's refined carbohydrates, crisps, bread, biscuits, snacks, anything you really buy in a packet, there's almost no nutrients in that. And all they're doing is feeding that gut dysbiosis. Working on these changes with the diet are, are going to have significant influences on the microflora. Our microbiome isn't just determined by the probiotics and the microbiome we're given at birth. It's very strongly influenced by the diet that we eat. And just eating refined carbohydrates is going to give you a certain type of gut flora. But if we're able to add meat and animal products, fermented foods, fruit and vegetable juices, soups and stews, we're going to be able to do a lot to improve the diversity of that microbiome and therefore improve the child's ability to function and develop that strong, healthy brain that we're looking for. It's really important that we make the gut work for the child's body instead of against it because it's one or the other either the digestive system is providing benefits of neurotransmitters and b-complex vitamins and nourishing the development of the brain or it is full of dysbiotic organisms that are producing harmful substances that damage the child's body overall but especially the brain and it perpetuates these sensory processing disorders that just leave that child feeling confused frustrated and unable to figure out the environment that it's in. It won't be able to process sensory input. It won't be able to process emotions. It won't be able to form meaningful connections. I can't imagine how heartbreaking it must be to see a child look into the mother's eyes and almost just this vacancy. You'd be expecting this most adoring love that you could ever feel and to just see this almost haze as the child takes all of this sensory input in. It takes all of this love, this warmth, and it can't process it. It can't feel it. It doesn't know what to do with it and it just shuts down, has a meltdown, has a tantrum because it can't understand no matter how hard it tries. If the probiotic and dietary changes alone aren't enough to start seeing significant changes, you can look at doing some microbiome testing. I generally find that microbiome testing isn't so good for children as it is for adults and even for adults, I still don't know how much weight I would give it, but it can be nice to have a little bit of extra data to know a little bit more about which beneficial organisms aren't there in the numbers that we want and if there are pathogens present, what they are and consequently, what toxins they would probably be producing and how that could be influencing the metabolism and the biomechanics of the body. The final thing that we've been looking at doing with regards to addressing these underlying biochemical dysfunctions would be to test the child's genetics and look at supporting them around their potential genetic mutations with regards to things like methylation. There are several genetic defects that make a child more likely to develop autism. And my favorite part about knowing this is that if you become aware of what genes the child has, it's very possible to supplement around them and make it so that these genes basically disappear appear. They don't count. They don't contribute towards the child developing autism anymore. One of the biggest examples here is the MTHFR gene. If the child has the MTHFR gene and surprise, surprise, an overwhelming majority of autistic children are heterozygous or homozygous MTHFR gene. And who would have guessed it? I'm heterozygous in MTHFR. So I have a lot of firsthand experience with this as well. And I know just how much my methylation status influences my autism-like symptoms. So if we can test the child's genes and have a look 
look at where it has some of these weaknesses and build a supplemental support plan around those genetics, we can support the body's ability to function. We can support its ability to complete the metabolic tasks that it wants to complete and aid it in the detoxification process so that it's able to function and also simultaneously clear this accumulated toxicity that is bathing the brain in toxicity, stopping it from perceiving sensory input correctly and causing it to develop in a semi-dysfunctional way. This is very easy to do. It's simply taking their saliva and using a company like 23andMe or Ancestry.com. You order a kit with them, they send it out. If you get it through Amazon, it's probably the next day. You just fill a vial with saliva, send it back. Then you take the raw data report, upload it to some free software like geneticgenie.org and they'll create a report so you can see what their methylation status is. I have another video talking all about this process, how you do this kind of testing and how you supplement around what the report tells you when you get that data back. And you can find a link to that video in the description below. But don't go just yet. I want you to get this last point on the video because this last point is all about providing additional supports and controlling their environment to make it so that even with the inhibited brain function that the child has, they're still able to develop themselves and their skills and their personality whilst we simultaneously work on doing all of the other things that I've talked about where we're addressing that underlying metabolic dysfunction. So the first thing I'd be looking at doing here would be limiting sensory overwhelm. If we can understand that the child is struggling to process the sensory input, we can try to create an environment that isn't costing them so much sensory processing. This means if they're trying to focus, make it so that the things that provide sensory input that are hard for them to process aren't there. Now this looks different for all of them. For some, it's noise. So certain types of noises. This could be a buzzling or a whistling in the background. This could be a TV program or the radio. Whatever it is, this noise is contributing sensory processing load to the child. So if we can remove it, that can help them concentrate. This could be things that you might not have even considered. This can even be things like the feeling of their elastic socks on their feet or a label on the back of their clothing or in their waistband. This is a form of sensory input that can be very distressing. It can feel extremely overwhelming and can really stop them from concentrating on the thing that they're trying to process. So becoming aware of what overwhelms that child and how we can control the environment to reduce that sensory load so that they're able to allocate more of the brain's resources to processing whatever it is that they're trying to figure out. The best way to think about it is to just go through a checklist of all of the senses and figure out how you can reduce sensory input on all of them. So this could be fragrances and smells. This could be the lighting of the room. Is it too bright? Is it too dark? This could be noises and audio. Is there a lot of background noise? Some children actually need some background noise to be able to concentrate. Some of them do well with things like binaural beats or meditation music or just something in the background. This could be their sense of touch. Does their clothing work for them? Are they in an environment where they have a good temperature? Some children can't focus because they're too hot or they're too cold and you might not be able to perceive it because you're within your window of tolerance, but their window of tolerance is significantly smaller. This can even be things like the haircut that they have, the clothing that they wear, the glasses that they wear. All of these things can contribute sensory load. So it's really worth just thinking about and trying to eliminate or minimize any of this unnecessary sensory load. It's going to allow them to allocate more resources to trying to process what they are trying to process that's important. The second is that you're going to need to develop a lot of attunement and support them in their ability to develop attunement and emotional capacity. And every child needs this, but autistic children need it more. Because all of that sensory input going into their brain isn't processing correctly, it's very hard for them to connect to other people. If you don't have autism, you're gonna be able to see patterns and understand how they're feeling and see what they're experiencing more easily than they will be able to do with you. So for example, if your autistic child plays in a way that doesn't make sense, you know, a lot of autistic children, instead of having toys that have wheels and rolling them, they will bang them. But a lot of the time, that banging isn't random. There's an order, there's a rhythm, there's a pattern. See if you can find a way to understand how the child is trying to play and play with them as they're able to play. I was playing with a child that has autism and we were playing with some pegs, just pegs that you would use to hang up washing or laundry. And the way I was playing with them was squeezing them open, putting them on my finger, clipping them onto things, making them hold things, stacking them up and the child didn't understand how I was playing with them and it was frustrating to her and she just didn't really want to play. So I tried to understand what she was doing. She would take two pegs out, sing a little, almost like a, not quite a song, but like a little tune in a rhythm. It was like, it was almost like she was trying to say one, two, three, go. And on go, she would take the pegs and throw them in the in the box. Now this isn't how I wanted to play because that's not what I would do with pegs. But this is how she was playing. So I picked up two pegs and started to do it with her. I would go one, two, 
two, three, go. And then we would throw them at the same time. And then the child like looked at me like, like what? Did, did you just understand how I was trying to play and you played with me? And there was like this kind of connection that I felt like she hadn't really ever felt because she's always trying to play, but because of the way that the brain is trying to process the sensory input, she's never felt like anyone could play with her in the way that she wanted to play. But because I understand, okay, this is how a sensory processing disorder works. This is how she's trying to play. We can't play on my terms because the brain, her brain doesn't work in the same terms that mine is, but I can use my brain to think about how her brain is working and try to play on her level and create connection on that level. And that's the key here. That's what this point is. It's about attuning yourself to the child and having enough emotional capacity to understand what the child is experiencing, trying to understand how the child is thinking, how that child's brain is working and connecting with them as they're able to connect with you. Every child needs this, but it's even more important for children with any form of sensory processing disorder, but especially autism. Autistic children feel so lonely because they just can't connect. So if you can show them that you can connect to them, that's going to do a lot to bridge that gap with how, with how they develop socially. And the final thing that we can do to support them is to support them through developmental milestones that they may have missed or that they may be delayed in. So for example, if the child is non-verbal, obviously we need to do all of these other things first. We need to clear the brain of toxicity. Learning how to speak requires a lot of sensory process in, a lot of cognition, a lot of understanding, and then the ability to express oneself, which in a way, in a social environment, is also a form of sensory input. So if you try to do these final supporting things without doing the initial six or six or so steps, it's only going to get you so far. But if we can do all of these things, address that root cause toxicity, support the brain development, provide the nutrients, support methylation, correct the gut flora, then it's also really important that we go back and address any milestones that have been missed. So if the child is nonverbal, going to speech therapy and helping them learn how to achieve that milestone that they weren't able to develop is really important. If for some reason the child has developed poor social skills and the child is say seven years old, but they're behaving socially as a four or five year old child would, it's really important that we support them to develop through those two years that they've missed because just throwing them in with a bunch of other seven year olds, those seven year olds have developed so much more socially that that child is just going to feel left out and they're not going to be able to take that social sensory input and process it. They're going to feel like an outcast. They're going to feel rejected. They're going to really struggle to, to process that experience, uh, have a meaningful developmental process as a consequence. So it's important that we support them through that socialization milestone that they may have missed. And finally, the emotional development, going to therapy, doing things like somatic processing, learning how to experience emotions, express emotions in a healthy way. These are all things that autistic children generally tend to struggle with. So providing them with additional support here is really important. There's a lot of different ways to do these things and it's always going to depend on where that child is missing their developmental milestones. But it's important that we attune the approach to the child and where the child has these needs. But again, just re-emphasizing, you can provide all of this support that you want. Don't address that underlying toxicity and how it's influencing the brain's development development is only going to do so much. So it's really important that we tackle all of these other things first, but this is just as important. It's just the next step, not the first step. So that's what I would do if my child had autism. If your child has autism and is dealing with any of the things that I outlined in today's video, my heart really goes out to you. I know this is a really tricky thing to be working through. I just want you to know that I know of several individuals that I've seen make massive improvements in the symptoms and the expression of their child's autism. There are a lot of things that you can do to see improvements improvements in this region. Unfortunately, you're not very likely to find much of a solution in mainstream medicine because they're not looking at this problem through this lens. The thing that really inspired me to make this video today is that I feel like I have an inside look at autism. I really feel like I understand it from a different angle than most people seem to look at it. And I really like to try to come at these things from a very positive, very empowered, very solutions orientated type of energy. And I just wanted to really share that energy with you today because I know how devastating it can be, not just emotionally, but also with the structure of the family, financially, socially, and the amount of extra stress and overwhelm this can cause in your life. So I really just wanted to give this information to you in the hopes that it helps you look at this situation from a different angle. If you want my help with anything that I outlined in today's video, be sure to shoot me an email, support at williamdickinson.co.uk. You can find a link in the description. And if you have any general questions, be sure to leave me a comment. I'll get back to every single one. I hope you found this video really helpful and really informative. Take care and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.